Hello and welcome to the Etch Play Weekly Live Show. I'm your host, host rather, Adam Burt. No, I've got one of the first words wrong in the show. This bodes badly for the rest of the episode. <laughs> this is a, I'm going to start. Awful start. I'm going to start again. I'm going to do it again. Hey, it's 4 p.m. <laughs> it's the Etch Play Weekly Live Show, and I'm your host, Adam Burt, and I'm joined today by the Dan with the plan. It's Dan Thomas. Hi, Dan. Hello. How are we How's doing? Going? <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Other than totally flubbing my intro to the one of the only responsibilities I have in the company. Um, <laughs> this is the weekly live show. If you've never watched before, we do all the latest news, uh, insight and industry discussion. We talk about it. Um, yeah, talk about goings on, really. Usually we talk about games getting delayed because that's what happens mostly in 2020. Uh, but this year we've got some, or this week rather, we've got some different stuff going on. First of all, let's start with the big news. Happy PlayStation 5 UK launch day to everyone Ooh. out there. Um, if you've got a PlayStation 5, congratulations. It seems like they were very difficult to acquire. Uh, and yeah, congratulations to everyone at Sony and at the PlayStation team. Um, very successful and popular launch. A, a worthy addition to the family, it sounds like. Um, are you keen for the PlayStation 5, Dan? I know you're not a big fan of the design of the shell i'm i'm extremely interested the more and more i see it um and see people unboxing theirs and playing their new games uh yeah it looks really good mm. but yeah i still don't like the actual physical box but <laughs> I, I, I i'd live with it where's the black one sony we all want the black one it's literally what everyone wants um elsewhere uh, in similar news uh, obviously the xbox launched last week uh, globally uh, it's gone pretty well for them. They've uh, given, given some stats here on their blog. Uh, more consoles sold on launch day than any previous Xbox. Um, so doing big numbers, probably helped in part by launching in so many countries at once, but still very impressive. Uh, and 70% of new Xbox consoles sold, so this is Series X or S, uh, have Game Pass attached. And that is a huge figure. Like, that's higher than I expected it to be. I mean, I think Game Pass is fantastic, but to hear that you know almost three quarters of people who buy one are signing up to the service is is impressive yeah definitely it's definitely uh, got a lot of momentum lately hasn't it yeah um so congratulations to them as well congratulations to both microsoft and sony you've done it you've launched a console during a pandemic year and uh, we look forward to seeing where you both go in 2021 um, some slightly somber news next. Uh, Montreal police uh, were unfortunately summoned to Ubisoft's office in Montreal on Friday afternoon. Uh, there were reports of a possible hostage taking, uh, but police later said that no threat had been found and it was reported that it was caused by a hoax. 911 call. Um, obviously, that's totally unacceptable and not something we want to see happen. Um, and sending our love to anyone at Ubisoft Montreal who was affected by, by this and or, or scared by it, frankly, because it was... Uh, a terrifying situation on the day as it was unfolding and wasn't entirely clear what was going on. Um, I think it goes without saying, uh, if there's doesn't matter what your personal opinions are about Ubisoft, uh, nobody deserves to be swatted or deserves to have the police call on them for, you know, that's actually a very dangerous thing to do. So, so don't do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of crime, unfortunately, staying on the crime theme, uh, Capcom were hacked uh, last week, hit by ransomware, which apparently compromised a lot of their data, but they also had some data leaked, uh, including stuff about games, uh, but also personal information of both staff and customers. Um, so you may even be personally affected if you're a Capcom customer. Um, a few interesting kind of tidbits out of that data that's leaked, and I guess it's interesting because they're going to have to adapt to this, they're going to have to change their plans. Um, but the, the launch date for Resident Evil Village, the next... Uh, game in the franchise is supposedly April 2021. Obviously, that's probably in flux. Uh, in terms of new games, Resident Evil Battle Royale is apparently in the making, and so is Street Fighter VI. Um, and yeah, I guess you have any thoughts about that, Dan, and, and, and how they might? Because like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's an unusual it's, it's situation an to be in. Yeah, it's a, a, an awful situation, and um, yeah, it's kind of part of what needs to be done is this constant battle. Uh, against these kind of um, these kind of occurrences, what is interesting uh, is kind of to see how Capcom will react. Obviously, I mean it's it's heartbreaking for the for the people involved in in the projects because you know they have plans and they have uh, release milestones and announce announcement schedules. So they've got they're going to have to do some hustle now to really 
uh, figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to change up their plan. Um, so yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what they do there. But um, yeah, perhaps p- potential to to do some interesting reactive marketing uh, based around that would would be perhaps the, my suggestion. Embrace it and see see what they can yeah. see what they can do. Yeah, and uh, obviously not in the same circumstances, but a lot of games do leak, so it's something that a lot of studios have to contend with in some way or another. Yeah, being that kind of adaptive mindset to your marketing is definitely key. Uh, one other interesting note about this, uh, internal documents also revealed some financial information about how much uh, Capcom were paid for certain things. Uh, and i just going to pick out one here because I think it's uh, of note. Uh, Google Stadia paid Capcom $10 million US dollars for Resident Evil 7 on Stadia. Um, which I think speaks to, I mean, that's a, quite a lot of money. Uh, that speaks to the investment that Google have made in, in Stadia and in streaming generally, um, which is something we're going to talk about more later in the show about the future of video game streaming and why it's you know very big business. So that's an interesting kind of associated bullet point to that. Um, let's do some positive news, shall we? I feel like we've just done all the bummer yeah. news like straight up front. <laughs> but it's... Usually we're a little bit more positive here, so let's focus on some good stuff. How about the Game Awards? Uh, These take place every year uh, in December, and this year's ceremony is December 10th. Uh, You can watch it online at the time. I think it was watched by like 50 million people last year. It's kind of the the closest thing video games has to an Oscars, I guess, um, for many people. Uh, And they announced the nominees uh, yesterday, in fact, and I can read off some of them for you here now. So nominated for Game of the Year, which is the big prize, are The Last of Us Part 2, Animal Crossing New Horizons, Hades, Ghost of Tsushima, Doom Eternal, and Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, Most of those games nominated for Game of the Year did well across all the categories. Uh, You also see an interesting new award that we mentioned on the show a few months back. The Innovation and Accessibility Award is brand new and celebrates games that push the boundaries of accessibility. So games nominated for that include the aforementioned Last of Us 2, but also Watch Dogs Legion and Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Grounded um, and some others as well. So that's really great. Um, That's a positive step for the industry to take to start recognising recognizing that. It, 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 yeah, absolutely is, and, and almost kind of incentivizing this is worthy of attention. Given an award category, I think that's a really great move. And um, yeah, it'd be really, it, it would be good to... For, for the awards to showcase what the innovations are in that area. I think there's an opportunity there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's good to see. Hopefully during the show, they'll uh, spend some time showing off those. Mm. Uh, Friends of Etch Play, uh, Hello Games been nominated for No Man's Sky uh, for two categories, actually, for Best Ongoing and for Best Community Support. So congratulations to Sean Murray and the team at Hello Games. We're very happy for you and we hope you win. Uh, you can vote for these if you want to. You can go to thegameawards.com slash nominees and cast your votes. Dan, who who's your vote going to for Game of the Year? Um, I wish you hadn't asked me that because I was looking at that earlier thinking, oh, I'm glad I don't have to pick who that <laughs> You do, who the audience award. picks. I would... I've not I've not played all of them, so I'm not in a position to judge. So I'm glad nobody is asking me uh, to make this decision. But uh, I'm a huge fan of Hades, as I know you are. But I also really enjoyed The Last of Us Part Two, um, and I haven't got around to playing Doom Eternal either. But uh, that looks a lot of fun. Mm. And obviously, um, oh, they're all they're all great. Um, <laughs> I'll go with Hades. I'll go with Hades because they're the smaller outfit. Yeah, and Team they, Hades. Yeah, You've heard it here first. I also support that. I voted for Hades. Uh, I would also be happy to see Animal Crossing win. I think Animal Crossing is obviously near and dear to a lot of people in the studio, in the team, and across the globe generally. It's been a big game this year, so I'd be very happy for them to win as well. Um, I've put the link in the chat. Uh, apparently we're a little bit laggy today. Uh, I apologise for that. Uh, I don't think it's anything I'm doing. Uh, I have some dropped frames, but other than that, it seems to be fairly stable my end. So maybe give it a refresh if it's still uh, not working for you, and hopefully it'll catch up. Um, moving on then, speaking of things that are celebratory and successful, Guildford Games Festival uh, was held digitally last week. We talked about it on the show. We had uh, Sam Reed on as a guest. And uh, Dan, have you got some stats to talk about this? Because this was a huge success, right? Yeah, it was. And there'll be more information shared imminently. Um, but I think some of the headline figures that, that we shared throughout the festival, we had 
well over two million viewers uh, view the the content that was created for the festival, and that, that we we helped to stream. Uh, our partners, Liquid Crimson, did a load of really good interviews um, and filming that uh, that went down really well. And uh, yeah, to, so the huge influx of audience for that came from the Guildford Games Steam page, which uh, Sam Reed and Gary Burchill helped wrangle. Um, that just brought us a huge, huge global audience. So yeah, 2 million viewers. Uh, the page featured, I think it was, um, th there was 17 games companies featured in the global top sellers, which was uh, nice to see. Um, yeah, uh, really, really successful. Blew us all away and, um, yeah, c consumed a lot of my attention last week from this uh, <laughs> Dan was basically a wall from the studio. He was, uh, <laughs> he was busy streaming Game Awards. Uh, uh, not Game Awards, Guild for Games. At one point, you were actually queuing the videos up manually, right? You just feed the yeah, videos into we, the system. I mean, yeah, I was, I was responsible for uh, streaming. We kind of, the, the, the responsibility escalated. Uh, and obviously, with this volume of audience, it became quite... Um, demanding of attention and then yes yeah, the streaming to steam because we streamed to steam and to twitch um twitch was kind of the the main place we were signposting and that was kind of like the official yeah. uh thread of of live content but we also because we had this presence on steam we also streamed the content there um and uh, yeah there were a couple of hiccups in keeping it going so i did for a while have to manually start each subsequent video <laughs> but i managed to figure that out in the end so. behind every yeah, great so stream is a man called dan pressing play at exactly the <laughs> we, right time and, and, to, to blow my own trunk for a bit we did end up streaming over 100 hours worth of content over the course of the two days across you know multiple multiple channels on multiple platforms and um, so that that was uh, yeah but it was really good really exciting yeah that's fantastic um this just dropped just before the show today actually a little while a little while ago uh, io interactive have announced their new project it's called project 007 it's a james bond game yeah. uh, featuring a wholly original bond story reads the press release players will step into the into the shoes of the world's favorite secret agent uh, you excited for this, Dan? You're a Hitman fan. You must be excited. I am a huge Hitman fan, huge Bond fan. And when you sent me the link to that video, uh, yeah, I think I was literal goosebumps of, of excitement. Oh, yeah, it's the Bond theme. You can't fail to get excited by that. And yeah. when you've got a lot of admiration for the studio and getting that that franchise involved, uh, yeah, I'm super super hyped for that. Uh, what's your favourite James Bond game throughout history? You a Goldeneye person? Are you Nightfire? Are you everything or nothing? I I was I never had an N sixty four, but I used to go around my mates, and it would be something we would spend hours and hours and hours playing Goldeneye. And um, that's obviously that, that's kind of the lo the low hanging fruit answer to that question. But I've got a lot of fond memories there. Although as as we've discussed, it's it has it hasn't aged well. I think it's fair mm. to say. Um, yeah, but. But for the impact it had at the time, um, yeah, that would that would be my pick. How about yourself? Uh, I was a big fan of Nightfire. Um, I think that was really good in the kind of uh, just from a multiplayer perspective. I think you're right about Goldeneye. It, it was good at the time, but it's uh, maybe lost some of its luster. I was trying to think of actually what was the last James Bond game, and I feel like the last James Bond game might have been a Goldeneye remake for the Wii, where they put Daniel yeah, really? Craig in it. Yeah, I um, I can't remember one since then. So it's been a while. Um, do you think this game plays like Hitman? Is that what you're envisaging? I, I mean, I hope there's. I'd like to see some element of that um, because it, they've, you know, they've got that formula down pat and they do it so well. Uh, they're and they, you know, they've got such a great uh, sort of talent for the aesthetic, mm. um, and I just think it's such a good complement to the, the 007 franchise. I, I would really like to see that, um, but. You know, they're a talented studio, and uh, if, if they go in a different direction, I'm sure that'd be interesting as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm. I'd love to see a, a Hitman esque yeah um, setup. That would that would, I'd be happy with that. Uh, and elsewhere, this is our and finally story. Uh, so you know, we like to finish on a games for good story, talking about how games can be a powerful force for good, which is something that we bring, bring us up because you've been you've been really down I'm, like, I'm bringing you up. This. I'm bringing you up. Scientists have now said, and this is based on research from Oxford University, that playing Animal Crossing is good for you. Specifically, it's good for your mental health. 
Um, even if you play it for quite a long time, apparently. So if you're one of the Animal Crossing aficionados out there, I know there are a few who watch the stream, um, congratulations. Your, your way of life has been approved by science. <laughs> They're officially saying that it's good for you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a nice article. It's nice to be reminded that video games have positive effects and not necessarily some of the kind of fear-mongering that you sometimes see about, um, about games and about their impact on people when they play them for long periods of time. And, and what a huge game to have been uh, cast as, as uh, having a positive impact. So there's a lot of people getting a lot of benefit from that. So yeah, that is, that is some very good news. Yep. And Ronnie Poncho is letting us know that the last Bond game was 007 Legends, but no one played it, so it's no surprise it's not remembered. Oh, okay. 007 Legends, eh? Yeah, I don't remember that one at <laughs> all. Um, it's been a while. It's been a while since we've had a good Bond game, so we would, we'd do one. Hopefully Io can knock it out of the park. Um, just on that uh, research, just if you're interested, because I am, I think it's interesting, uh, it didn't just include Nintendo, it also included data from Electronic Arts about Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville. Um, so it's based on survey data, over 6,000 survey responses and 2,700 data sets. Um, so yeah, the the extract reads, contrary to many fears that excessive game time will lead to addiction and poor mental health, we found a small positive relation between gameplay and well-being. So. And in addition to scientific papers, the ultimate authority who has featured on our show previously, Tony, can confirm. So yep. that's our, our uh, friendly Animal Crossing expert. So that, that's that's good for me. Yeah, she confirms Animal Crossing good for you. You've been prescribed Animal Crossing. <laughs> Go to your nearest pharmacist and demand a copy of Animal Crossing and a Switch. Uh, we're going to throw to a pre-recorded segment. Uh, this is Tetris Effect Connected. If you've not seen this and you're thinking, oh, Tetris, I'm going to turn off. That's boring. Don't turn off because Tetris Effect Connected is a fantastic game. And I think you're going to be interested in, in watching this clip. Um, and it's not that long, so stick around. And when we come back, we'll be talking about the future of video game streaming. We'll see you soon. Hello, this is Tetris Effect Connected. Uh, it's a version of Tetris, and you've probably played Tetris before. Maybe never quite like this. Uh, Tetris Effect came to the PlayStation, uh, I believe, last year, and was a version of Tetris that had very nice visual effects and nice musical cues. You know, it makes sounds when the blocks hit, and you can do things in time to the music, and it's all very pleasant. Uh, this is a new version, uh, available for Xbox Series X and PC, uh, and Series S, obviously. Um, called Connected, and uh, it's got multiplayer in it, which is what we're doing right now. So three of us on the left-hand side are teaming up, it's cooperative, against the Pisces boss on the right-hand side. Um, and we're just playing Tetris at the minute. The boss can throw things at us, like it can populate our screens with junk, or it can prevent us from doing abilities in Tetris, such as dropping the pieces quickly, or soft dropping, or hard dropping. Um, which are terms you might know if you're a Tetris aficionado. I am not. I'm actually not very good at Tetris, which you'll see during this video. Uh, we're going to try and take this boss down, um, and you'll see how it works as it, as it progresses. I know it's quite a lot when you first see it, but let's uh, see if we can get into it a bit here. You'll probably hear the music pulsing in the background. Let's see if we can make something happen here. Here we go. This is it. It's what you've all been waiting for. You ready for this? You're not ready. Boom! We're all playing Tetris together on one field. We're taking it in turns. It's awkward. But it's fun. Waiting for blue to place. And the more lines we place here, the more damage we do to the, uh, to the boss. You also get these pink pieces in this mode, uh, which are interesting because they collapse when you place them and they kind of fall into, into holes, which makes them quite useful. Um, so yeah, working together. And the more lines we build, the more damage we do. Um, there. The rhythm when you're playing with the players is a little bit strange. Like you can you have to kind of wait for them, but it is, I mean, I never get bored of this bit. Turn again. Oh, 
Boom. Got all that damage we did. Now the game's a lot harder for the boss, obviously. And uh, we'll see if we can uh, take him down, shall we? Let's work together on this. Uh, I don't want that piece really. Or that one. put things on my field. I'm a little bit smarter here actually. This boss has uh, got some moves. Like I say, I'm uh, very far away from being a Tetris pro, so if you're wondering why I'm not doing the obviously good Tetris moves, it's because I didn't think of them. Approximately half the blocks I place are accidents. We're getting close to the mode again where we get to team up. And what's interesting about that mode actually is that now, for example, you should just place loads of blocks because they're all going to collapse when the mode starts. Uh, uh. Here we go. Look at that. Look how stacked my side is. Boom. Now that's nice. as a team. He took my spot. Nice. He's very close to being screwed there. You can see how little space he's got to work with. There it is! We win! Congratulations to Shadow Master and Slappy as Hell, my randomly selected multiplayer teammates. Um, I wasn't the best player on the team. I wasn't the best player on the team. I think I was there for morale, you know? Uh, it's going to keep going. We're going to just go fight more bosses, but I'm going to throw it back to the studio. This is Tetris Effect Connected. If you have an Xbox Series X or S and you're thinking, hmm, games are pretty slim on the ground at the minute, um, then play this. Or if you're a big Tetris fan, definitely play this. because It's a great way to play Tetris. Back to the studio. And we're back. This is the X Play Weekly Live Show, and that was Tetris Effect Connected. Uh, like I said in the video, it's available on Game Pass, so definitely check it out. It's a great way to play Tetris if you're a Tetris beginner or a Tetris pro. It's got something for everyone. Um, I'm back with Dan Thomas. Uh, thanks for joining me, Dan. Uh, we're going to talk about the future of video game streaming, uh, and this is kind of in association with a blog post that we've written, and it has the provocative title, The Last Console You'll Ever Buy. I'm going to put the link in chat so you can uh, access that at your leisure. But yeah, um, it's the launch of new consoles. Xbox launched last week, PlayStation 5 launched this week, um, and it's been seven years since the PlayStation 3, or since the PlayStation 4 rather, and the Xbox One first hit store shelves. So we were thinking, what's the next seven years going to look like? Uh, and obviously that's a very difficult thing to uh, to fathom or to figure out. Nobody actually has a crystal ball. Um, but there are some interesting trends that we thought were worth noticing and uh, and, and discussing. Um, chief among them, I think, that the article talks about primarily is this idea that consoles as we know them might not exist in the same form. So I think you can definitely expect a half-step console. Um, we're very used to kind of pro and the slim versions now. I'd be surprised if we didn't get one of those. But towards the tail end of this generation, based on trends in internet speed and in anticipated change of consumer behavior, 
it might be that streaming platforms are taking a lot bigger share of, of the kind of gaming pie. Um, and, and we're going to talk about it. Dan, have you ever streamed a game? You have, right? I think I've seen you stream <laughs> I, a game. <laughs> I, I have, yeah. Not, not as much as I... Uh always intend to but uh, mm. yes I, I am familiar with the concept <laughs> have you ever played a game Dan Ooh. <laughs> yeah, interesting aren't they we should talk about those one day yeah um, in no, terms I, of I, the I, sorry go ahead I've done the I've, I've, I've uh, had experienced uh, streaming services and they've varied from early on being like how on earth is anybody supposed to play this to the more recent efforts when i'm like this is voodoo i'm streaming a console quality game to my phone and i'm i I actually even i think it was crackdown 3 on um the game pass experience i was playing it on the ferry to work Mm, so that was a I, i can't imagine there are many people that have uh done that test so yeah played crackdown 3 on a ferry That is a unique experience. That's a bucket list item right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you talked about Game Pass, and it's, it's worth talking about the major players, because one of the big things and one of the key indicators of this trend is the amount of straight-up investment that's going into this space. So, obviously, Google have invested heavily in Google Stadia. That's part of their strategy, at least currently. You know what Google are like. They might kill it at some point. But for now, at least, it seems to be a key part of their plans. Amazon have announced Amazon Luna. I don't know if you've heard of Amazon. They're also one of the richest companies in the world. Uh, Jeff Bezos, he's got the money, and he does what he wants with it. Um, and recently, Microsoft, you mentioned Game Pass, which is, you know, Game Pass is already, I think, the start of a real paradigm shift in the way people purchase games. Because when you get Game Pass, you really have to understand how transformative it is, the idea of being able to access a huge library whenever you want. Um, is is really amazing and it just enables you to kind of try games that you would usually, you know, maybe see on a store shelf but be like, oh, I can't really justify spending 40, 50, 60 or even 70 pounds nowadays on on buying it to see if I like it and then bring it back. It just lowers those barriers to entry and and Microsoft have invested big in in content. Um, Their studio, obviously, they have increased the number of studios they own quite dramatically, including their recent $7 billion acquisition of uh, Zenimax and Bethesda, which is still technically not closed, but seems like a done deal at this point. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, all the big players, with the possible exception of, of Sony, well, they do have PlayStation now, so they have at least some toes in this, in this pool, um, are, are gearing up for this kind of streaming fight. Kind of, it's going to be the Netflix versus Amazon Prime, but of games. Um, and in that sense, I guess it feels like a matter of of when rather than if. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would. And I think the biggest debate is is how long and and how feasible. Because there are there are, I mean, to stream a AAA high quality. 4k responsive gaming experience is no mean feat um and there is a reason why a you know you'll you'll pay hundreds of pounds for a games console or even thousands of pounds for a uh, a, yeah. a highly capable pc um so and and then to to do that at scale for a remotely connected audience um is is yeah no mean feat but as as you've mentioned there are some pretty big players figuring it out um who they have the the money to yeah to work out what works and and potentially uh, ride the um ride the curve of as as we know kind of over time technology costs reduce speeds increase and so so yeah yeah i completely agree i think there's um there's always people, when we talk about this, like it's people who, who disagree, and that's that's totally fine, obviously. Um, it is, it is after all, a matter of pure speculation. Uh, if we could actually predict the future, I'd be playing the lottery, not here doing this show. But um, there are a lot of people who think, well, I would never do that. Like, I would never change. And, and maybe you wouldn't. I think there, there are people, and the article uses this as a frame of reference. You think about the vinyl experience for music fans. You know, vinyl is the best way empirically statistically to listen to music it's the purest form the way you can listen to music with the highest quality 
Um, but it involves kit, it involves expensive purchases, and it's something that collectors and hobbyists are prepared to do. But maybe the average music listener, you know, the man on the street, the person who plays infrequently or isn't that invested in, you know, the quality being the absolute maximum it could be, those people are people that we expect to, to transition to this over a long period of time as well. Like, you know, when we talk about this, we're not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. I think I think most of these services are a long way from being mass market successes. There's no real household name yet. But I think that seven years is a really long time. It's such a long time in terms of consumer behavior, in terms of, you know, how long it takes people to adopt things. Because I think when you think about Spotify and Netflix and, and other things that have done this in, in similar industries or even something like the the Amazon Kindle, like they have that kind of ramp up time and then they almost kind of explode at a certain point where usually at the point where the price becomes mass market equitable, it becomes something that everyone's like, well, that's that's obviously better than what I'm doing. I'm paying paying for things individually like an idiot. What am I doing? Why would I be spending this much money on one thing when I could just grab all the things? Um, and I think that's that's probably the point at which this becomes a reality, and that's why I think Game Pass is in a really strong position, assuming they can, you know, make it work technically, because they already have arguably the best subscription-based library in the business, um, and obviously that's something that the others are going to challenge. It's something that Ubisoft were already starting to gear up for their own channel. They're working with Amazon. It's something that Google Stadia is already attempting to challenge. Um, so yeah, fascinating times for the for the industry at large, and hopefully we'll get to look back on this in seven years and be like, man, we totally called it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is also I think really interesting is you kind of you're mentioning consumer behaviour, and you know the the best objectively the best gaming experiences do require that premium kit and and that is out of reach to a lot of people and we've discussed before um and i don't know the exact figure but we're essentially saying in in western markets kind of 50 percent of all people are now playing games to some degree whether that's facebook games mobile games or um sort of core, core game experiences and the reason the facebook and mobile games are such a contributing factor to those numbers is because of the accessibility you know if everybody has a phone everybody has a web browser um, so you can you can try things and get familiar yeah. with them and the correct implementation that we eventually reach of game streaming kind of again kind of it lowers that barrier to entry and we can start to present core game experiences to a broader audience um, but that will also be interesting then to see the knock-on effect that has on how games are made and you know we the biggest games uh, rely on known behaviors and all of a sudden we're going to be introducing an audience who don't have those they don't know that mm. typically this button jumps and minimaps do this and you know they don't know they don't aren't familiar with those conventions which yeah. in turn is going to have an impact on the game experience that gets developed to make a better onboard. It's kind of like going back to introducing these concepts again to this yeah. new audience. So that would be really interesting. Neither of them utilize, you know, cloud streaming technology, but I think and it's an interesting parallel with, you think about some of the breakout hits of this year, specifically things like Among Us and, and Genshin Impact. Like those are both games that are hyper accessible. Like, they're free to play on a phone. You can you can just get into those if you want to. The barrier to entry is so low. And that's, I think, yeah, I think where bigger games want to get. And there's been an increasing, you know, not just in the way they're delivered, but in the way that they're designed, an increasing trend towards games having a lower barrier to entry. And free to play is a huge part of that. You know, you look at things like Fortnite, like the next Halo is supposed to have free to play multiplayer in it. And if you go back in time to the release of Halo 3 and you told people, hey, they're going to give that, they're going to give probably the best bit of the game away for free. <laughs> they would have thought you were crazy. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the times we live in now, and it's there's so much competition for people's attention and eyeballs and time that if your barrier to entry is high, you're just essentially screwing yourself out of, out of potential revenue. Um, obviously, there's lots of ways to monetize, and not all, not all of them are great. Um but first and foremost, you need to have people actually play your game or engage with it in some way to be able to reach the point at which they can, you know, make a transaction with you or 
subscribe to what you're offering. Um, but yeah, the article is up on etchuk.com slash play. Uh, you can see it there. It's called The Last Console You'll Ever Buy. Uh, give it a read. Um, the show's nearly over, so you can go there and read it shortly. And if you like it, share it on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. Talk about it. And you can always tweet us as well. We're on Twitter, at etchplay. Um, Dan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you doing double duty on the stream today. Quite all right. And uh, we'll be back next week at the usual time of 4 p.m. If you're watching us live on Twitch, then make sure you don't miss it because you can just follow right now. It's down there. A little button. It's purple. It says follow on it. Just press it and then you'll get notified when we go live next. If you're watching the catch up on YouTube, that's okay. You're busy. I get it. Um, make sure you subscribe on YouTube and then you'll see us in your feed as well. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Keep waving out to the music. Yep, hit it. Man, that looks massive. <laughs>